On October the 31st, 1517, Martin Luther posted 95 big questions which he believed faced the church of his day to a local church door in Wittenberg, Germany. 500 years later, I decided to post 95 new questions, one a week, to the web, questions which I believe the church must face in the 21st century. Our lives are precious, they're sacred, every single moment of them. The opportunity to live rather than sleepwalk through our days belongs to each one of us. There's a story about the famous 18th century Polish Jewish leader, Rabbi Zusha, who explained to his students one day, in the coming world, they never ask me, why were you not Moses? Instead, they'll ask me, why were you not Zusha? The sacred journey of life, it turns out, is a quest to find ourselves and our place in the world. It's a wonderful journey of self-discovery and it belongs to every single one of us. For some while back, I sat chatting over a cup of coffee with a senior representative of the British establishment. We talked for a little while about his life. He'd enjoyed the privilege of being educated at one of Britain's most prestigious public schools and then one of its oldest and finest universities. But now in his mid-40s, he held an extremely influential position professionally and he'd come to see me because of the number of schools that Oasis is responsible for to discuss a new initiative which he'd been made responsible for. His task was to develop a national scheme for mentoring young people. During our conversation, he lamented the number of highly paid, professionally successful people he meets in the course of his work, who he told me it was clear was simply drifting, sleepwalking through life, as he put it, wasting, squandering their talent. In response, I told him about a meeting I'd recently been in, in a smart hotel, where out of the corner of my eye I'd watched a very well-known, very well-educated public figure slumped all evening in a corner by the bar, drowning in one gin after another. Alone, abandoned and isolated, with a reputation for being socially challenging, he sat there with no one and with nowhere to go. His struggle I said, wasn't that he didn't have the right educational qualifications from the right establishments, it was well known that he had the lot. His problem was that his IQ was not matched by his EQ, his emotional quotient, or his SQ, his spiritual quotient. The primary question I suggested for any mentoring course for young people or people of any and every age group is not what you do with your life, as important as that question is, but rather something much deeper about who you become while you're doing it. It's a question of our character rather than our career. My visitor looked shocked. He paused before hesitatingly explaining through, that throughout his education and subsequent career, he'd never, ever been asked that question. He told me he'd had countless careers advice sessions where he'd been asked about his professional ambitions as well as his aspirations around salary and lifestyle, but he said not once had he ever been confronted with life's primary question. What kind of person do you want to become? I think that the church has made a huge mistake. It somehow turned being a Christian into an academic pursuit where faith has been swapped for belief and belief has come to mean little more than the intellectual assent to a set of doctrines and rigid views. Christianity is about faith, not belief, and there's a big difference. Faith is about having trust, whereas belief is more akin to having opinions. It's possible to hold beliefs passionately and to argue about them until the cows come home without them ever really making a scrap of positive difference to us. 
But faith is not about beliefs, creeds, opinions and arguments. It's more instinctive than that. It's more fundamental than that. When Jesus said, follow me, I think he meant it literally. Live my way, surrender your reformer ambitions, change your priorities, make your target to love God and to love your neighbour, whoever they are, the way you love yourself. The problem is that we've turned what Jesus said into a metaphor for adopting some rigid views and then feeling free to carry on exactly as we were. Another friend of mine found himself introduced once to a young woman who'd only recently joined a church community. Are you a Christian? He asked her. He told me that she was visibly shocked. How would I know? She said. You'll have to ask my friends. Only they can answer that one. So a question, perhaps the most challenging question of the lot. When Jesus said, follow me, what do you think he had in mind? Or to put it differently, what does a person who places their faith rather than their belief in Christ actually look like? I hope you're enjoying Chalk Talk and the opportunity to think through and discuss some of the questions it raises week by week. And with exactly that in mind, I'd like to invite you to one of a series of events I'm doing around the country called In the Name of Love, the Bible, Gender Identity and Same-Sex Relationships. I'll be joined by some notable guests for this series of one-day conferences asking questions about what the Bible has to say about gender identity and same-sex relationships and what it means for us in everyday life. So often, in the church, we struggle to explore and to agree or disagree well when it comes to social issues. In the name of love will be different. Just like Chalk Talk, rather than being dogmatic, it will leave plenty of space for discussion and questions. So, no matter where you are on your journey with this issue, you are most welcome. I mean it. We'll be in Birmingham, Manchester, Sheffield and Southampton in the months to come. More details, including sponsorship to attend, can be found in the description on my Facebook page or at openchurch.network slash events. Once again, that's openchurch.network slash events.